Hi class, in this lecture here we want to begin our discussion of two sample hypothesis testing. And what we're going to do is over the coming lectures um, we're going to learn about the following. First thing we're going to start talking about is the hypothesis testing for two means. And there's going to be three different videos that we're actually going to, three different video lectures that are actually going to cover this. So the first video, this one here, is going to um, provide uh, an introduction to just what's going on and then we're going to talk about using independent stamp samples. This is with the standard deviations not assumed equal. So we'll discuss briefly when standard deviations are assumed equal, but basically it's selecting or not selecting one option in your calculator. Okay, so this right here will be the first lecture. Then what we'll do is we'll talk about using what's called paired samples. I'm going to follow that up with a different lecture. Then actually what I'm going to do is I'm going to do a video that uh, explains the difference between the two, how you know to select them, and what happens if you select incorrectly. So lecture number three, what we're going to do there is we're just going to show the difference between this independent samples and paired samples. And then what I'm going to do is we're going to talk about, as we've been doing in the class, right, we did like confidence intervals for a mean, um, then we did hypothesis testing for a mean, but then we also did confidence intervals for a proportion, and then hypothesis testing for a proportion. What we'll then do here is we'll talk about hypothesis testing for two, pro two proportions. And the good news is, is there's only one way for this. And then I'll follow that up with a, a fourth lecture in this series. Okay, we're going to focus very, very heavily on our um, graphing calculators as well when we go through these lectures. So I encourage you, you know, as you're following along, make sure you have your TI-83 or TI-84 calculator handy. All right, so let's let's kind of begin to set the stage of what I mean by hypothesis testing for two means. So like, we'll, 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 we'll develop an example here, okay? And so again, this lecture is just going to be about hypothesis testing for two means, and this is independent samples, and we're going to assume the standard deviations are not equal. All right, so what's going on here? So to set this up, let me ask a question here. Do computers help middle school students learn math? Okay, so like, you know, what we want to do is we're going to introduce technology in the classroom, and, you know, we're going to see if, you know, if we give students a computer, for whatever reason, right, will that help them learn and master math? And it's like, I don't know, okay? Um, so maybe, so we, we're gonna need a method to test this, okay? So right now it's, it's, it's unsure, but you know, the predominant thinking is that, uh, yeah, 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 you know, having a computer would help, okay? But um, maybe it does. So here's the thing, how would you go about testing this? Well, what you would need actually is you'd need to compare two different groups of students, okay? What you would do is you'd give one group, group one, we'll just call them. You'd give them computers for the year, okay? And, you know, go through about, you know, teaching them the same basic math math lessons, but, you know, they, they have access to computers in the classroom so they can go, look, you know, look up a supplemental material on the Internet or perhaps use, you know, the built-in calculators in their computer for, you know, just for whatever, whatever ways they want, they will use the computers to help them learn math. Then what you'll do is you'll have a second group of students and you won't give them computers, okay? And you'll give them the same lessons and they'll learn math the old school way. Okay, so they're not given computers. So. But then how would you compare them, right? You know, what you'd have to do is you'd have to assess them, okay? At the end of the, at, maybe at the end of the academic year, you'd give them the both, both the same test and you'd compare their scores. So what, a common way you would do this is then you would compare
their scores, okay, so both for group one and for group two, on some standardized test. And so, you know, basically what you would do is you'd look at you'd, the mean score in group one and you compare it to the mean mean score on the standardized test in group two. Okay, and, that, and that's basically what you would do. You, you don't want to just compare like one student compared to another, right? You would just want to look at overall compare the groups. So you compare the mean scores between the groups. So this is two, this is what I mean by two sample hypothesis testing. Okay, we have two different samples here. We have one sample where we have a group one where we give them a computer. And then we have another sample group two where they're not given a computer. Okay, so we have the, this is now two sample. So comparing two samples. All right, so we're going to need a method for, for testing these. All right, let's start talking about that. All right, so here, here's the example here. So do, do computers help a high school, or a little bit of a typo here, middle school students, sorry. Learn math. Well, we, we have this, uh, uh, this standardized test and kind of an experiment that was done that tests this. So the National Assessment of Educational Progress, NAEP, has been testing students for the past 30 years. So what I have here is I have scores on the NAEP mathematics test range from 0 to 500. 0 being the lowest, 500 is the highest score you can get. Now the NAAP mathematics assessment is given every two years to students at grades four and eight, and then approximately every four years at grade 12, okay? The assessment measures both mathematics knowledge and the student's ability to apply their knowledge in problem solving situations. So here's what happened. In a recent year, they conducted a study comparing the scores, now this was grade eight, so this is middle school, of students who regularly used a computer in their classes to students who did not regularly use a computer in their classes, all right? And results from the study are shown below. So what we have here is we have, these are the scores of, of the students who use the computer in their class, and these are scores of students who did not use the computer. And so on average, students in the class with a computer scored a 309 on this test that's graded from 0 to 500. And with the out of computer, they, they scored a 303. Okay, and then you can see I also have the standard deviation and the sample sizes. And look, just at first glance, right? First glance, they're scoring a little, you know, it's only a six point difference, but, but scores are higher. On average. When using a computer. But like, you know, is that difference, you know, six point difference big enough to say for sure that, um, having a computer does increase, you know, uh, scores on average, or is, is that difference not big enough to, to formulate any conclusion? Okay. And we need a hypo we need to actually perform the hypothesis test to, to, to see that. All right. So there is a difference in the score as expected. After all, if we were to sample two groups of students at random, we would expect to see some difference. That's just by chance. So the question we need to address is whether the difference in test scores are due to chance okay, just, you know, random sampling, or whether they reflect a real association, okay? And the real association here is that computers are impacting learning. So the basic principle is simple. The smaller the difference, the more like uh, it is due to, more likely it is due to chance. And the larger the differences are more likely to reflect a real association, okay? So now the question becomes, how do we determine when the difference is large enough to justify concluding that it reflects a real association? That is the question that our hypothesis tests are designed to answer. And so what we're gonna do here is it's gonna be the same basic five-step process. Okay, that we had before. Step one, set up the test. Step two, level of significance. Test statistic, p-value, conclusion. Same as we've been doing with all of our hypothesis tests previously. However, what's going to change here is notation is going to be a little different because now we have two samples we need to talk about. Um, and then, uh, you know, what we use in our calculator, our TI-84, TI-83 calculator is going to change a little bit. 
All right, so first thing we have to do is, is talk about what type of tests we will run. And so here's the thing, here's a great thing. It's the same three tests. Okay, we have the left-tailed, the right-tailed, and the two-tailed test. Okay, but here's the thing now, we have two samples. So now we're comparing two means. So the parameters we're investigating are two means. So we have two of them. We have mu sub one, okay? That's the population mean associated with the first sample. And then we have to define mu sub two, a second mean. Okay, so this is the population mean associated with the second sample. And now, now we can go and set up our tests. Okay, so I'll actually start with the um, two-tailed test here. And then we'll talk about what the left-tailed test looked like. And then we have our right-tailed test. All right, so hypothesis testing, as we've been talking about, um, is two statements. We have our null hypothesis, and we have our alternative hypothesis. Well, as we saw in previous lectures, the null is always a statement of equality. So we're going to start off where mu sub 1 is equal to mu sub 2. So the two population means are, are, are the same. There's, there's, there's no difference in them. Okay. And what we're going to look to show evidence for is, wait a sec, no way. The, the, those two means are different somehow. Okay. Left tailed test. Again, you'd set up your two statements. Your null is always a statement of an equality that the two means are equal to each other. And with the left tail test, what you're saying is, hey, mu one here, uh, that, that mean is definitely less than, less than mu two. Okay, it's, it's you know, smaller somehow. The right tail test would then be the flip of this. We start with the statement of equality, mu one is equal to mu two. The, the population means are the same. And here what we're looking at to show is that, no way, uh, mu one is greater than mu two, okay? For whatever reason, this, this mean is, is, is larger, okay? And as you've heard me discuss in, in, in previous lectures, like if you can set this up correctly right here and then get to your TI-83 or TI-84 calculator, the rest of it kind of just falls into place. All right, so correctly identifying the two parameters you're investigating and then setting up the test is the most important important piece of the puzzle to this hypothesis test. Okay, from here we get into the um, uh, five-step process. And for our course, we're always going to perform what's called a non-pooled t-test. All right, and what this just means is that we're going to say the, pot, the standard deviations... between the two populations all right this standard like for let me go back for a second so even though our sample standard deviations are pretty close here what we're going to assume is the standard deviation for test scores of those with computers is not the same as the standard deviation of test scores for those without computers okay so are not the same and it's just an option in your calculator, and your calculator always um, defaults to a non-pooled test, okay? All right, so here's the thing. What we're going to do, to the purpose here is to perform a hypothesis test to compare two population means, like we saw in the previous slide, mu sub 1 and mu sub 2. So here are the assumptions, simple random samples. The two samples are independent of each other. 
Okay, so let me go back for a second. What that means here is this sample, the test scores had no bearing on the test scores of this sample. They, weren't, they didn't interact in any way. All right, and then we have normal underlying populations or we have large enough samples where the central limit theorem is, is met, okay? All right, so step one, you gotta set up the test. All right, so the null hypothesis is always, you know, mu one is equal to mu two. And then the alternative hypothesis is one of the, um, uh, the alternative is one of these. You have the two-tailed, the left-tailed, or the right-tailed. Step two, you're going to decide on a level of significance. For our course, I'm going to give this to you. Then step three and step four. Step three, you're going to compute the test statistic. And what this does is it takes all the information in the test or in the, in the problem and boils it down to a single number. So you take the mean of sample one minus the mean of sample two and you divide it by standard deviation, um, the square root of the variance of the first sample divided by the sample size of the first one plus the variance of the second sample divided by the sample size of the second uh, um, uh, sample. And this is going to be denoted as t sub zero. Okay, great news here. Great news. We're just going to use our calculator for this. A little bit of a typo there. Give me a second. I'm going to use it for step three and then step four. Okay, what we do is we compute the p-value, and now our test statistic has degree of fee, the degrees of freedom, what we call delta here, which is this crazy formula. So what we're going to do, instead of using this, this formula in any way, we're also just going to have our calculator uh, give us step four. So the good news, right, use technology when we can, all right? And then step five, we're just going to make a conclusion. So if your p-value is less than the level of significance, you reject the null. Otherwise, if the p-value is greater than the level of significance, you fail to reject the null. That's all. Same conclusion we've been making before, all right? What's really hard here, all right, again, is just setting up the test correctly and then inputting the information correctly into your calculator. Once you can do that, your calculator is going to spit out you know, the answers to step three and four for you, and then you can jump right right ahead and make a conclusion. Okay, so pooled versus non-pooled. Like, what's going on here? Okay, so choosing between a pooled and a non-pooled uh, t-test here, or a hypothesis test here. So again, we're always going to assume or always do a non-pooled, okay? For our course... always non-pooled. All right, so basically just suppose you want to use independent simple random sampling to compare the means of two populations. To decide between a pooled T procedure and a non-pooled T procedure, just follow these guidelines. If you are reasonably sure the populations have equal standard deviations, use pooled T. Otherwise, just use non-pooled. So for us, we're always just going to default to non-pooled. Okay, we're just not going to, you know, we're not going to just straight off the bat assume that the population standard deviations are equal, all right? All right, so we're just gonna use our calculator for everything. So our calculator is really, again, gonna give us the test statistic. And the p-value, all right? So the first thing you're going to have to do to do this using your calculator, and I'll show you, is as always, you're going to press the stat button. You're going to scroll over to tests. And the one we are always going to use here, all right, is going to be this option number four. It's going to be two sample t test. We're never going to do a two sample z test. I won't give you the population standard deviations like we've done in previous lectures. We're just going to go to how it's done in, 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 in practice. We're going to use this two sample t test right here. So right off the bat, the first thing you're going to have to decide is if I give you the summary statistics or the stats, I will give you examples of each of those. 
and then you know just put it in the calculator boom get the test statistic get the p-value and make a conclusion all right so in the following lectures i have three examples for us so we'll work through three examples and hopefully by the end of those you, it'll give you a good idea of what's uh what's going on here all right so here's a problem do computers help middle school students learn math and what we're going to do is we're going to test at the 0 0.05 level of significance. So that's my alpha. All right, so same type of, of stuff as before. We're going to look at this uh, NAEP test between two groups of um, eighth grade students, those that use computers regularly and those that did not use computers regularly. All right. Let's, 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 let's do this. First thing you're going to have to do is set up the test. So what you remember what's going on here. You're testing to see if computers um, help learn math. So what would happen is if people, if students used a computer, they would, you know, help them learn math. In theory, they should score higher, higher on this test, okay? Because the computer helped them learn math better, okay? So what this is going to be is it's going to be a right tail test. So you have to define two, two parameters. So we're going to let mu1 be equal to the mean score on the NAEP exam. For students who used computers regularly. So who use computers on a regular basis. And then what we're going to do is we're going to compare that to U mu sub 2. Okay, and this is going to be the mean score on the NAEP exam. for students who did not use computers on a regular basis. And so how we're going to then set this test up is look like this. Our null hypothesis is going to be that mu1 is equal to mu2. Okay, we're going to assume, yeah, you know, basic starting assumption will be that computers do not have a, a, an impact on, on learning math. And what we want to see here is no way, no way, uh, test to see if computers will help. So if computers do help, what should happen is the mean test scores for those using computers should be higher than mu sub 2. All right, now watch how quickly this will, will go. We're going to select our level of significance, which was 0 0.05. And then we're going to have our test statistic and our p-value. So watch, I'm going to go load up my calculator. And I am comparing two samples. So I'm going to go stat, test, this could be option number four. And what happens here is I gave you the summary statistics. So I'm going to scroll over to stats. Now let me go back to the previous slide here. What I have here, and this is where you have to be careful, x sub 1, x bar sub 1, s sub x1, and n sub 1 deals with your first sample. Well, with how I defined that was with computers. So the students scored a 309. Standard deviation was 29, and there were 60 students in that group. X bar sub 2 is 303. 32 was the standard deviation, and then 40 was the sample size. And then here's where it gets a little tricky. What we were doing, we were testing to see if mu1 was greater than mu2. 
Here you'll see that pooled option, so the calculator defaults to no. We're going to leave it at that. We're going to scroll down to calculate. And you should see something like this right here. So here it shows you what the alternative is. This T below, this first one here is our test statistic. So it's 0 0.9533 when I round it. And right here is my p-value. It's 0 0.1717. Okay, right here, your calculator gives you the, shows you what the alternative was, test statistic, p-value. Awesome. So now you need to make a conclusion. Well, look, the p-value is greater than the level of significance, so we fail to reject the null. All right, this was because the p-value was greater than alpha, level of significance. So look, what that means here is that there's no evidence to suggest that students who use the calculator or use the calculator, use the computer regularly will score higher on average on this test. Okay, so evidence does not suggest using a computer regularly will increase the mean score on the NAEP exam for eighth graders. Notice how the, the, the conclusion actually is a subtle difference if it actually helps them learn math, you know, because um, really the only metric we have here is to compare their, their scores on this exam and use that to judge how well they actually learn math. And there's a lot of issues with that, obviously, right? But but here, what, what it seems to imply here is that using computers on a regular basis in the classroom isn't really going to impact how well students at least perform on these, these standardized tests in math. All right, let's switch, let's switch gears and try another one. This is about a uh, post-surgical treatment. So suppose after college you're hired by Westchester Medical Group. Okay, they're a, a Summit Health company, as a data analyst. And your first task on the job is to study the effectiveness of a new post-surgical treatment for hip replacement. Okay, so you know these we have these 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 patients and what they're doing is they're given this this hip hip replacement. And um, you know we're, we we want to see if the you know people are like oh we have this new post-surgical treatment, basically will it will it will it you know decrease the number of days that they're going to spend uh, in recovery. It means they get them to recovery quicker. So what happens is the subjects are evenly divided into two groups. We have what's called the treatment group and they receive the, the new post-surgical treatment. Okay. Um, so they're, again, they're getting the new treatment. They're getting this special thing that should help, you know, decrease recovery times. And then we have the control group. Okay. And they just received the standard treatment. And so what you have here is you have the recovery times and days are given below. So I'm giving you the raw data here. So you're given the data. And basically, so what happens is, is like the first patient who got the new treatment only needed, you know, seven days for recovery. Another patient who got the control, got the traditional treatment, they, they took 14. And you can see here, I, I did put the, the, the recovery times in order here, but these are the, the recovery times of individuals who got the new treatment. And these are recovery times of individuals who got just the standard treatment, okay? So the question is, can you conclude the mean recovery times for those receiving the new treatment is less than the mean time of those receiving the standard treatment, okay? And this is tested at the 0 0.05 level of significance. So look, this sample is going to be associated with um, mu sub 1, and this sample is going to be associated with mu sub 2. All right, so let's go through it.
you're going to have to set up the test. So you're defining two, two means here. So mu sub 1 is going to be the mean recovery time. Getting new treatment. And mu sub 2 is going to be the mean recovery time. getting what they called, I don't want to say old treatment, what they called the standard treatment, okay, whatever that involves. And so what we're testing here, okay, we're going to start with the assumption that they're equal, okay, that, that there's no difference in the treatments. And what we're saying is, is mu1 leads to a faster recovery time. That's what we want to test to see. So it would be that mu sub 1 would be less than mu sub 2, right here. Watch what happens and how quickly this goes as, once we get this going All right, with our calculator. So level of significance is 0 0.05. We have our test statistic, and we have the p-value. And so with the raw data, what you're going to have to do is you're going to have to plug it into the, the calculator. So let me grab my trusty calculator here. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to go back to this slide here. Okay. And so what the first thing you have to do is you have to input the data in the calculator. So if you remember to do that, what you're going to do is you're going to press the stat button. And under edit here, you're going to edit the list. Now in L1, you're going to want to put uh, sample 1. So 7, 8, 12, 13, 15, 19, 20 days, 21 days, 24 days, and then 25 days. Now in L2, what you're going to do is you're going to put the um, uh, the the sample two. Okay, so this 14 days, 16 days, 18, 23, 24, 30, 32, 35, 39, and 42. I just want to note actually, so. Here, the sample sizes are the same. It doesn't actually have, they don't have to be the same. I just want to note that right off the bat. So even though these two sample sizes are the same, they don't have to be. All right, so now what are we going to do to uh, get the test statistic now and the p-value? After I have the data plugged in, I'm going to go stat. I'm going to scroll over to tests. And it was option number four. And what I'm going to do here is I'm going to scroll over to data. And then it's going to say, all right, list one is our sample one was in list one, L1. Our, our, our second sample was in list two, L2. We're going to count each frequency once. And then what you have to do, you have to make sure you match the alternative. What? Look, it was less than. So I'm testing to see that mu1 is less than mu2. We're doing a non-pooled test. And we're going to scroll down to calculate. And you should see something like this. So my test statistic is negative 2.9527. And our p-value here, ooh, pretty low, 0 0.0048. All right, so what's our conclusion? Well, look, the p-value is less than the level of significance. So we're going to reject the null. So look, evidence is supporting the alternative here. So what we're able to conclude when we do this is it does seem that on average,
Recovery times are shorter. with the new treatment. Okay. And look, this is, you know, this is, this would be a standard practice, you know, uh, to test a new treatment. And, and look, we're able to see whatever this new treatment involves. It does, it does seem like it's, it's reducing recovery times. So, you know, you'd want to you know, institute this new treatment going forward. All right, let's do one last one. This will be a little, little fun, I think. This is about comparing uh, males to females. So this is about empathy. So the Interpersonal Reactivity Index is a survey designed to assess four types of empathy, and there's a link to the test. One type of empathy called em empathic concern, em or empathetic concern, excuse me, empathetic concern, Measures the tendency to feel sympathy and compassion for people who are less fortunate. Okay. The index range from zero, meaning you're less empathetic, to uh, 28, meaning you're more empathetic. So suppose a sociologist just wants to test to see if there is a difference. So that right there kind of tells me a two-tailed test, just to see if there's a difference. And the mean empathy score between men and women. Okay. You know, like, I don't know. Should... should do we think there's a difference between the two sexes here in terms of their empathy? I don't know. I think, you know, people form a conclusion, but let's see. So the sociologist randomly samples a group of males. So there's 15 males in the first group and females. There's 16 uh, females in the second group and records their results on the empathetic concern part of the survey. Okay. So remember, the scores can be between 0 and 28. So here are the scores for the males right here. So this will be our sample one. And then this will be our sample two, the scores of the females. And we just want to test to see if they're different. So can you conclude that there is a difference in the mean empathy score between men and women and use the 0 0.05 level of significance? And uh, you know, on your own after, you should just run the test again to see if males actually scored lower than females, just for, just for fun. All right, so what we're looking at is the mean scores on this uh, uh, survey for empathy, okay? So basically we're just, again, we're just looking at the empathetic concern part of the survey. So we're gonna set up the test. We're gonna let mu one, what that's gonna be is the mean score for males on the survey. For their, I'm just going to say survey, but what, I, what I'm meaning is their empathetic concern score on the survey. And mu2 will be the mean score for females on the survey. And what we wanted to test to see was just to see if the scores are different. Okay. So we'll start with mu1 is equal to mu2. And what we're going to investigate is no way. They're, they're, they're different. Level of significance is 0 0.05. So again, we're going to use our calculator here to find the test statistic and the p-value. So what we're going to have to do, um, going to load up our calculator here. And we're going to have to input the data. So I'm going to go back to stat, I'm going to edit the list, and I'm going to clear out the two previous prop, two previous lists. Okay. So my sample one was the male. So I got to put in the males 13. It doesn't matter what order you put it in by the way. I'm just going by rows. 12, 16, 13, 26, 21, 23, and then this one person got really low on the Empathetic concern score. Got an eight, it's 15, 18, 20, 25, 15, 23, and 17. And then in list two, what we're going to do is we're going to put the females, female scores. 
and you know in general you know what you're seeing here is in general they do they do look higher you know i don't want to make draw any conclusion but it does seem like they're they're higher on average All right, and notice here the sample sizes are not equal, and that and that's okay. That's not a big deal. All right, so after you have the data plugged in, we're going to go back. And again, we're going to do stat, tests, and it was option number four here. Again, we have the data. So L1, L2, that's good. And here we just wanted to do a two-tailed test. We just want to see that they're different. And you should see something like this. The, the test statistic comes back as negative 3.1468. And my p-value pretty low, 0 0.0045. All right, pretty low again. So what does that mean? <laughs> well, again, we're going to reject the null here. So evidence is supporting the alternative that they're not equal. Okay, so that the p-value is less than alpha. And evidence suggests the mean scores on the survey are not are not equal. They're different. So men and women, it seems, are scoring different on this empathetic concern uh, survey. So it looks like it does look like there's a little bit of a difference between uh, males and females here. All right, class. Well, we'll look. So I, I hope you can see that you know, defining the perimeter, setting up the test, and then you can get to the calculator, and you know, calculator is going to give you that test statistic and p-value, and it's all about drawing that conclusion and what it means. As always, if you have any questions, I'm I'm here.